Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Dramatically Improve Your Security with Cortex Services and Avanti. My name is Hannah Westra with Cortex Services, and joining me is Chris Gettle from Avanti. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to address. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available to you after the session. If you have any questions during the session, you can enter them in the question box, or if you prefer, you can save them for the question and answer session at the end. All right, so Chris, um, if you can move it over to the next slide for me. All right, so we've already um, started the first bullet of uh, welcoming and housekeeping. Um, next, I'm going to go over just a brief core tech overview, highlighting uh, what we are and who, who we are and what we do as a company. And then I'm going to hand it over to Chris with Avanti to handle uh, patch management, audi automation, and best practices for your organization. All right. So Cortex Services, we are an IT solutions integrator based in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Uh, we were founded in 2005, um, and we really want to become a trusted advisor for our clients. Uh, we do that through our values of attitude, um, integrity, and relationships. We never say it's not my job, and we um, are always willing to go the extra mile to get your job, your, your project done completely. Uh, uh, to completion. Um, our mission statement is project success, no exceptions. And we were really founded on virtualization solutions in the healthcare industry. Um, through that, we've become the highest level of partner uh, partnership through different virtualization companies, including Avanti, Improvada, Citrix, VMware, and iGel. Um, we also are a managed global uh, Microsoft solutions provider. Um, and we also have recently, um, in the past two years, um, become a cloud solutions provider uh, through Microsoft Azure. Um, throughout our history, we've uh, had multiple recognitions through different awards. Um, we were uh, Central Partner of the Year with Citrix and Avanti. Uh, we were Nutanix Healthcare Partner of the Year. And we've won uh, various best and brightest uh, awards throughout um, the nation over the past um, decade. So now I'm going to go over the different solution stacks that we cover. So as I mentioned, we started as a virtualization company, um, and throughout our development of our organization, we've um, grown heavily into different practices as well, including data, data center, managed solutions. So after we help set up your environment, uh, we can take it to the next step and manage that environment for you. So your organization isn't um, constantly firing, uh, you know, going, putting out fires. We're able to manage that for you so you can work on in, in your innovative solutions. Uh, as I mentioned, we also are a Microsoft uh, Cloud Solutions provider. And we help uh, deliver Microsoft solutions to organizations throughout the nation as well. And just a brief customer testimonial, um, Steve Lance from Torrance Memorial Medical Center in California, um, that's a large cl uh, client of ours. Um, just he stated here, Cortec was really committed to understanding what we needed and facilitated a lot of conversations about how the staff operated. They didn't rush to define and implement a solution. So that just goes to tell you that, you know, we are, we want to become a trusted advisor for you. We're not just going to go in um, and have a quick fix solution. We want to go in, understand your environment, understand what your business goals are, and help you achieve them. And then just another case study here. Uh, we recently implemented a large um, uh, virtualization solution uh, for a large healthcare system in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and here's just kind of going over that solution. Um, we, you know, they, we engaged with the customer for four years. We really took the, the extra step to understand really their business objectives, what the problems that they were having, 
and um, we just took the lead in troubleshooting, um, developed an integrated test plan to rule out what technologies work for them, what systems they currently had in place to leverage the current technology, and then add some additional solutions that were really best practices for them. If you're interested in more information, I'm happy to send over um, you know, our client uh, executives so, uh, information on this if you're interested in hearing more about this, this uh, success story. And at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris Gettle with Avanti. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Anna. You know, one of the reasons that we, we love working with Cortec is uh, we've got a very similar approach to this. Um, Avanti doesn't have a, a single approach to how we address security. We've actually got a variety of security solutions that, um, you know, help address a variety of different security needs. Um, so as we go through today, we're going to talk a bit about, um, you know, the changes in the security um, space, uh, a lot of the new threats and the evolving threats that we're running into, and then talk a bit about the, uh, the security strategy from Avanti and how we can help address your needs depending on specific situations. Um, so when you look at uh, security in general, uh, there, there's no secret, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only a matter of there's rising concerns. There's more threats out there today. There's more risks evolving each day. Um, you know, if you look at some uh, uh, stats from these different vendors, it, it's, it's becoming more and more easy for hackers to gain access to and stand on the shoulders of, um, you know, much more, um, you know, intelligent uh, coders. Um, it's, it's really like, you know, it's, it is a development market. You've got your, um, you know, framework developers who create um, the technologies. You've got um, the next tier down, the developers who take the work that they've done and can take off the shelf components and then incorporate it into what they want to drive out. And then you've got the, you know, they've even got tech support and they've got their own marketing departments. When you talk about ransomware, I mean, literally it is a truly a business operation. Um, so when you start to deal with, um, you know, a, a, a threat actor like that, it becomes very challenging to try to defend yourself against them. Um, so as, as these types of threats evolve, we've got to be able to respond to and provide a level of defense um, to be able to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, you know, again, you can see that, uh, you know, 40% of spam uh, would, you know, potentially contain ransomware nowadays. Um, one in two executives has experienced some form of a ransomware attack. Um, so these are all rising challenges that we're seeing. 90% of security incidents, whether it's a breach or, you know, a ransomware attack, whatever the case may be, um, fundamentally the first entry point is a type of phishing attack. Uh, 33 or 30% of recipients of a phishing email message will open that message and 12% of recipients will click on the attachment. In fact, um, if, you, if you look at that 12%, half of those, or about 6% of those, the first click is gonna happen within an hour of receipt within your organization, which means that before IT even knows about it, there's already at least one instance of that phishing attempt getting into your environment. So statistically, as an attacker, I would really only need to get about 10 email addresses for your company, and at that point, I've got near um, a 90% or better chance of launching whatever attack it is I want to get into your environment, whether it's a ransomware attack or you know some type of malware I want to put in place, an advanced persistent threat where that's going to be my foothold, where then I will then start to move throughout your environment. So one of the things that's very important is education. Um, you know, educating your users, educating uh, you know the business of the importance of security. Um, it's and it's not just driving the the fear uh, of oh we could be next. No, it's really a matter of it's not a matter of um, if, it's a matter of when, and everybody being more aware reduces the level of impact that we're gonna see overall. Um, so when you start to look at um, the different types of threats out there, you know, and looking at what those real costs are, whether it's, you know, uh, you know the FedEx, what they were saying uh, about the Petty attack, the financial impact that they had, um, you know, the ransomware attacks as they, um, you know, when they hit MERS, um, causing widespread disruption to their operations. The, the real costs of uh, a, a malware attack or a ransomware attack today are downtime, you know, damaged or lost data, lost productivity because you've got people out, um, you know, forensic investigation. It costs a bit of money to, to try to investigate these things further and make sure that 
the, the, um, the threat has truly been stamped out of your environment. Um, data system restoration, reputation, you, you definitely take a hit on reputation when these types of things happen, and potentially even fines. Um, you know, so all of these things, it's really hard to calculate um, the true impact of um, a, a malware attack or a ransomware attack to your environment. You know, as we looked at this year, um, you know, we, we saw a number of threats that um, have taken things to a, a new level. Uh, WannaCry was a, a great example of how taking ransomware and coupling it with, you know, a worm-like capability, uh, like we saw with the WannaCry attack, really kind of entered it into a whole new level of threat. Um, what we saw with the NotPetya attack a little bit later wasn't truly ransomware anymore. Ransomware in this case was evolved. Um, it was no longer ransomware for financial gain. It was ransomware targeted at um, disruption at an economic and a social level. Um, so it, in this case, you know, it, it is truly uh, ransomware that had been weaponized to um, have a mass amount of impact um, on a specific target. If you look at, um, this was actually data pulled together from Semantics showing um, in the early stages of uh, NotPetya, how many um, uh, you know, affected organizations there were um, a day after the initial attack. You could see here, it was pretty obvious that the Ukraine was the epicenter for that attack. And then there were a number of other countries that were hit pretty hard from that. But again, this was um, you know, definitely premeditated. You know, if, for those of you who don't uh, know uh, a lot of the full details about that, the opening salvo of NotPetya actually began several days before the initial launch of the attack. Um, a, a vendor in the Ukraine, there were, there's basically two tax vendors in the Ukraine that you would submit your, your tax returns through um, countrywide for businesses. One of those two vendors was targeted and their software updates actually became the vehicle for delivering the initial attack um, of the, the NotPetya ransomware attack. Um, so with that, you had a very focused um, attack that was meant at uh, widespread disruption. Um, and the reality of that, this image was actually one of those taken from uh, the East Ukraine showing a shopping center. And you could see all the distinctive red text across all the screens there. This was just one of many different uh, parts of um, the economy that were hit by this attack. You had oil plants, hospitals, shipping, logistics, factories, supermarkets, government, airlines, um, metro systems, power plants, law firms, telecom, um, food conglomerates, banking, hospitals, pharmaceuticals. Think of, think of walking out your door that morning, jumping on the train, getting to work, going through part of your day, and all of a sudden having a uh, disruption throughout the office. People standing up, uh, you know, looking around, trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, suddenly your screen goes to um, a blue screen and then this red text comes up you try to reach out to IT, they're overwhelmed. You end up talking to a few of your coworkers, you leave the office going to say, oh yeah, we'll just take an early lunch, let them figure this out. On your way, you stop for, you know, to grab some cash because you want to go to the, your favorite place that doesn't take credit cards. And you find that the ATM has a very distinctive black screen with red text as well. Um, later on throughout the day, you go back to the train station to try to jump on the train. There's a massive congestion of people because they can't actually board the trains. None of the transit systems are allowing them to gain access through to jump on a train to get home. Um, this is the type of widespread impact that was seen with that attack. So taking, taking a, a threat that we have today, coupling it with worm-like capabilities with the SMB exploits that were utilized there and using that in a weaponized form for mass disruption, um, it, it opened up a, a whole new realm of possibilities with an attack like that. So this is the face of, of malware and ransomware um, that we're going to be looking at in the future. Um, so that's where we have, to, we have to make sure that our security practices are doubling down and really ensuring that we've reduced the overall um, threat uh, surface or the attack surface that exists within our organizations and also our ability to respond more. So we're going to be talking a bit about uh, some of those fundamentals today. Um, you know, so... This, this threat is already real. Um, there's more than 4,000 ransomware attacks per day since January 2016. That was a 300% increase over 2015. Um, so 
again, the the um, the increase in this is uh, uh, starting to reach exponential rates. The problems that we're hearing on a regular basis, you know, the the struggles that our customers are having is how do they ensure compliance? Um, they're they're having compliance issues or delays due to complexity of the problem. How do you measure and ensure that security is properly being implemented throughout your organization? There's a resource shortage in IT security teams, a skill set shortage even. Um, it's really hard to meet all the different demands today and ensure that you've got those skill sets. So what you need is not only um, you know a solution that can solve a specific problem, but a solution that can also help you bridge some of those skill gaps and vendors that can help become those trusted advisors to help supplement your teams to better um, address these challenges. There's gaps and uh, new threats that impact um, you know, the security risks to your environment. How do you identify and address those? And then there's obviously the rising cost of oversight and compliance. You know, one of the things that um, it, it happens regularly is uh, you know, going to um, a security show and you look around at all the new technologies out there and you see these great solutions that tell an amazing story about how they address ransomware very specifically. Well, if that's the purview of what I'm looking at, what about all the other threats out there? Ransomware is a big one, absolutely. But we've got to make sure that we, we don't get caught up in um, picking up 15 best of breed products to you know, build a, a layered approach to cybersecurity because at that point, you're going to break your bank. Um, your, your security budget won't be able to address all those needs when going with that many point solutions. So it's building a foundational layer in uh, preventative measures and then building up and picking out solutions that help fill in those gaps where your organization is most threatened. Um, so this was actually a quote from a survey that um, the Avanti team did alongside uh, one of our partners. And um, uh, we, we had 100 CIOs and CSOs that uh, gave us some great feedback, but this was one quote that really stood out there. You don't need 15 best of breed products for a successful layered approach to cybersecurity. Um, with the right solutions, with the right approach, um, there, it is possible to provide a comprehensive security strategy without breaking your budget. So, you know, one of the things that's critically important with that is preventing your security strategy from trying to achieve defense in depth and really getting to expense in depth. If you start to focus in too narrowly on each of these different areas, you could get lost in that very easily and find out that when you go on to the next project, that budget has disappeared. One of the next key findings that we had was, uh, this, this was a very distinct quote that stood out as well. IT wants things to work smoothly while security wants security. And you know, we, we had a number of other data points from this, this line of questioning here, but one of the things that was found is a lot of the responsibilities of each of these, each of these teams respectively have started to, to blur that line. And we're finding that more and more these two teams are having to work together. And one of the challenges though is they've each got a mandate that isn't necessarily going to be easy to, to align with. IT needs things to work smoothly. They need to enable the user and empower the business. Security needs to secure things. They need to reduce those risks. They need to make sure that our environment is as resilient and uh, secure as possible. At the end point, if we don't make these things work together well, the fastest way to get a security control thrown back out of the environment is to you know, break the ability to do business and cripple the user's ability to execute their job. So that's one thing that we take very seriously is that um, that ability to provide defense in depth, the ability to make sure that we can address a full breadth of risks, reduce that attack surface, detect malicious ac activity, and be able to take action to solve those problems. At the same time, we have to balance that security need with the user's needs. If we lock things down too tight, we can't do business. We can't operate. We cripple our users to the point where they can't be effective. And then issues like shadow IT and other uh, you know, uh, problems that we face today start to compound and become more of an issue. So the user needs that freedom, that ability to work, and the business needs to thrive. So we got to bring this together and make sure that we're, we're achieving that at the end point. So one of the things that we've done is we've looked to a variety of different uh, security frameworks. And you guys are bound by many of these. I, I, I saw the list of uh, you know, people attending today. We've got healthcare, we've got uh, 
you know, uh, different parts of other industries, uh, commercial, retail, you guys all have various needs that you have to make sure to comply with. Some of you have PCI needs. That's only at one, one part of your environment. How do you bring those security practices to the whole of the organization? For those of you with HIPAA requirements, same thing there. The other problem is when you look at these frameworks, you get a wealth of information that you have to deliver. And with that, one thing that these frameworks often lack is a roadmap. That, that set of instructions of where do I start and where can I maximize my effectiveness as I walk through that. So one of the things that we looked at as we were trying to shape our security strategy is how do we bring all these different regulatory requirements together and how do we help guide our customers with the steps that they should prioritize first because they will maximize the effectiveness of the security program. And that's where we came down to the CIS critical security controls. So the Center for Internet Security does a few things um, very well, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of outline a couple of those here. Now, it, it may not be the framework that's right for any everyone, but if you're looking for a way to define how your security strategy may operate, this could be a good choice for you. Um, looking at that, They've got a, this really cool poster that actually cross-references the CIS security controls into PCI, into FISMA, into his, uh, HIPAA, um, into GDPR. Um, so all over the place, we can actually see, hey, by doing this security control, you're helping fulfill these different requirements in the frameworks that matter to you. Um, one other thing that the CIS uh, framework does very well is it prioritizes those actions. If you start at number one and execute through 35, each step of the way, you're getting the maximum benefit with each of those things that you do. If you skip straight down to number 20, you're not going to get as effective of a, um, a, a implementation. Like you, you won't maximize your effectiveness by skipping the first 19. If you go through one through 19 first and then go to 20, you will, you know, get a lot more uh, value from those first, uh, you know, 19 in reducing the threats to your organization. Now, that doesn't mean everybody has to follow this exactly. Um, one of the most important things about this is there's a, there's a very well-defined kind of 80-20 rule that starts to come to play here, which is what I'm going to go into next. The first five controls of this framework, by doing these things well, and depending on which, which group you look at, um, the CIS team um, evaluated and showed that if you do these first five well, you can actually mitigate or eliminate 90% or better of the cyber threats that we face today. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to take care of all of them. It's really hard to get to, um, you know, past 90%. It's impossible to get to 100% secure. The only way to get there is literally unplug it from the network, power it off, and don't touch it. So trying to get to 100%, nigh on unachievable. Trying to get to that 80% or better, very doable. And we can, you, you can do this very effectively with, um, by focusing in on even just the first five controls. The most important of these are number one and number two, discovery, inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices and software. If I can't see it, if I don't know about it, I can't secure it. Discovery is the foundation for any security strategy. If you can't discover all the assets and uh, you know, systems that are able to touch your environments, there's no way you're going to be able to identify where your threats are all coming from. Beyond that, once we've identified everything in our environments, we can get into secure configuration, continuous vulnerability assessment or remediation, and controlled use of administrative privileges. Now, as you dig into those three controls, um, you know, one of the different groups that um, actually participates in the Center for Internet Security's uh, strategy is the Australian Signals Directorate. They've got a framework, and in theirs, their top four maps exactly to the top five from the CIS, and they kind of word it in a way where it's a lot easier to understand. It's um, whitelisting or application control, patching the applications, patching the OS, and privilege management. Those four things done effectively, the ASD study that they did shows that you're at that point able to achieve 85% or better of um, you know, uh, preventing the different types of cyber threats out there today. So. Patch management is the area that we're going to kind of focus in on very specifically today, but getting into um, application control or application whitelisting and minimizing ab, uh, admin privileges, at that point, you can effectively get past 80% 80, 80 of the um, risk reduction to, to achieve a good security strategy. Now, beyond there, it's very important to keep on investing in your security program. Look at 
the different detect and response capabilities and expanding your um, you know, ability to get towards more of a SecOps model where you're working incidents and trying to identify security risks and threats proactively and be able to go out and even hunt for those. But the strongest detect and response capabilities in the world and the best um, security team in the world won't stand a chance if you haven't done these things well. And it became very apparent as WannaCry and NotPetya hit the globe that there's still a lot of organizations out there that struggle to, to meet these, um, these basics of their security program or even to, to meet them in a timely manner. Um, so the defense in depth solutions at Avanti, um, you know, again, we're gonna talk a bit more about the patch and vulnerability layer today, but uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the foundational layer. With that, you're gonna get a significant reduction in your, the attack surface throughout your environment. App control and privilege management, there's no environment that I've found yet where you don't end up with um, some exceptions to your patch process. Oh yeah, you know we can put this patch in 90% of our environment, but this group over here has a critical application where if we update that software, it's gonna break. Okay, well, we need to be able to mitigate that. What additional security layers can we layer on in there? How can we get that defense in depth where each of these working together can help us achieve that level of security? Also, you know, there's, there's a rise in fileless malware. Um, this is one of those areas where there's, there can be attacks that can happen that aren't exploiting a software vulnerability. So I can't patch them to resolve that. So that's where these additional layers of security come into play. So as you build into a layered uh, defense in depth approach, again, with just the first two layers on the left here, you're achieving that level of 80%, um, 85% or better that um, uh, many of the, the security uh, frameworks are helping us to try to achieve. All right, so getting more into the patch and vulnerability management level. You know, one of the things that um, you know, is happening a lot more frequently is um, you know, attackers are able to, again, because of the way that um, they're standing on the shoulders of you know, a, a small number of very intelligent coders, people who know the ins and outs of these different uh, operating systems and applications who can find new exploits and um, uncover them and take advantage of them. The most attacks that we're seeing today are literally taking the work that those few have done and spreading it out and being able to take it to a market, a black market where they can utilize these um, ex exploits very rapidly. So 50% of vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited in the life of that vulnerability. So let's say, let's just take 100 as our count right now. If um, 10 out of those 100 vulnerabilities are going to be exploited at some point in the future, five out of those 10 are gonna happen within the first two to four weeks of an update being released from the vendor. Um, so that means, you know, with, with Patch Tuesday, um, if there's a, you know, a number of, uh, you know, public disclosures or things like that in there, the, the vulnerabilities that are um, being disclosed there, there's a high chance that several of those are going to be candidates for these vulnerabilities that are exploited in a very rapid um, time frame. So there is, there is a, um, a short window there before exploits start to occur. Now, by the time we get to a 40 to 60 day range, 90%, so nine out of those 10 vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited in our little scenario here, would have been exploited by that 40 to 60 day range. The average enterprise can take up to 120 days to deploy vendor updates. And again, <laughs> it was uh, very apparent as we went through WannaCry and uh, NotPetya, those SMB exploits, by the time WannaCry hit, that was literally three patch cycles that had gone by. We were already reaching that 90 to 120 day window. When NotPetya hit, still the same exploit being utilized there um, it still reached a global level impact uh, because a lot of those organizations still hadn't gotten those updates all in place. Um, so the ability to um, have the tools available, the solution in place to be able to react faster, to identify risks sooner, to deliver updates more seamlessly and with a better experience is critically important if we're gonna tackle this type of challenge. Now, one other thing that's very interesting no matter how much the threat landscape, the, you know, the different types of attacks are evolving today, this, this quote here really struck me uh, as I read the article that this came from. Um, 
this guy is CEO of Across Security. He's been doing pen testing and uh, you know um, security research for over 20 years. Um, but uh, he's he's still hacking his customers' networks the same way he was doing back in 1999. Find a public exploit for a vulnerability that's less than four months old. Fits very well with our 120 stat. Tailor that exploit to work with your remote administration tool. Again, going back to our attackers and how they're buying off-the-shelf exploits to be able to utilize and attack things, they can basically take this month's hot exploit and then two months later, take the new one and be able to try to do the same attack again just with a new exploit leading the way. Mutate that exploit until uh, it can uh, beat common threat defense, you know, virus total being a common one there, um, and then fish a user to get that foothold. Um, now, we saw with, um, you know, WannaCry and NotPetya that once you get on that single foothold, if you can take advantage of a worm-like uh, vulnerability, the SMB exploit allowed it to spread rapidly. NotPetya went even further. It not only had the SMB exploit, but it could do a level of uh, compromising a local credential. Um, if that local user was a, a full admin, and if that credential had rights elsewhere in the environment, that attack could also jump through additional means beyond a vulnerability on other OSs. Um, so it was a, a very interesting, and actually I, I compare that um, to the, the last um, type of uh, um, worm-like exploit that um, really reached that level of sophistication. Um, if you guys remember Configer back in 2008, it used a variety of things from a software vulnerability to brute force uh, password um, hacking to be able to spread itself. So it had a spectrum, a way to go around, multiple ways to go around and utilize different tools within your environment that were just existing there to try to spread. So again, that layered approach to security becomes very important as the sophistication increases with a, a piece of malware that really is more of a platform attack. All right, so now before I mention that, um, you know, one of the things that, again, I, I think is very similar between Cortex approach and Ivanti's approach is we're not going to come in and just sell you, hey, here's our patch management solution. There you go. You're all set. It's really more of a we're, we're looking to understand each of you as a business. You're all going to have different needs. We've got a variety of solutions to help um, deliver that. Are you trying to patch endpoints? very very much automatically and automate the entire process and have very little involvement other than to set schedules and things like that. Are you trying to tackle the data center? Many of you have physical and virtual systems. You've got premise and cloud. You've got a need to be uh, branching beyond all these things. We've got solutions that are ideal for those types of environments. And there's many of you who have already made a significant investment in a platform like SCCM. And you're already doing patching there, but you don't get the third-party applications where most of the software vulnerabilities exist. Um, if you look at, on average, uh, um, each year, the number of vulnerabilities addressed by um, each vendor, Microsoft is maybe 20% of what's vulnerable in the software layer within your environment. Um, the other 80% come from the Adobe products, Google, um, Apple, uh, uh, Oracle, uh, all these different applications that exist in your environment that's where a lot of the vulnerabilities exist. In fact, um, there's another slide that I don't have in this presentation, but the top 10 vulnerabilities that were exploited in 2016, seven out of 10 of those were Flash, Flash related, because they know it's everywhere. Now, the good news is Flash is on a decline. It's on its way out. But, you know, I'll, I'll go back in time even further. Before Flash became our number one notorious um, vulnerable product on our networks, the one that was most targeted before that was Java. Um, so as Flash declines, what's going to be the new target? What's going to be the next vulnerable, nasty piece of software that we all need, but we have to protect against because it's going to be that, that Achilles heel for all of us. Um, but going back to this, so there's a variety of different needs here that um, you know each of you might have a unique combination of needing. Um, some of you might need to, you know, take advantage of our, our third-party catalog to enhance SCCM to be able to address that other 80%. That might not be the same solution that you need for your data center. So you might use a combination of our solutions there. So as we go through this, we can help tailor the solutions to fit your specific needs.
All right, so getting into patching uh, a little bit more in depth. You know, one of the things that um, we always advocate for, in fact, um, you know, my, myself and uh, one of uh, the other product managers on my team who focuses specifically on our patch level technologies, uh, we do a, a patch best practice um, um, update each year. Um, and this is a, a couple of the things that um, have kind of become a staple within that best practice model that we try to um, evangelize. Patch often, patch everything, patch everywhere. You know, Microsoft may have their patch Tuesday, the second Tuesday of the month. In fact, I'm wondering why that, that was there on two bullets. That must have been a mistake. Um, Adobe, Reader, and Flash usually fall on patch Tuesday, but there can be out of bands. And when there are out of bands, they're usually very critical. Oracle releases their cycle um, on the second or the Tuesday closest to the 17th of January, April, July, and October. And often that's the week after Patch Tuesday. So depending on when that drops, you have a yet another um, you know cycle that uh, kind of begins there. And then you've got uh, other vendors like uh, Google and uh, Mozilla and other common products in your organization that drop on all sorts of various cadences. Um, so beyond Microsoft, there's really very little regularity. Um, so when you start to look at the different risks to your environment, a desktop, that's going to stay in the environment. A server, you know where that is. Laptops can go in and out. All of a sudden, I leave the environment and I'm exposed to a number of other things because all the perimeter defenses are gone. So how do I, how do I make sure that that user is uh, more effectively secured because they can, they're a higher risk uh, level? How do I deal with those remote users? Um, you know, one common thing, a, a good example of that is, especially for those of you in the healthcare space, I haven't talked to a, a hospital yet that doesn't have, um, you know, a, they're commonly referred to as coders. Um, the people who um, are basically doing data entry, um, updating, uh, you know, records, uh, entering uh, um, claims or client uh, data or things like that, they're often working remotely, logging into your network through Citrix, um, but there's, there's an, another risk there. They're always off network. That system that's off network needs to be sec as secured as the Citrix environment they're logging into. Um, so we have a, a mentality that we we call it follow the user. Um, many of our technologies have a way to support that that system on or off network indefinitely. Um, so that's another area where it's 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 great to have that comprehensive ability to you know patch often. Um, we actually release content twice a week, um, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, for uh, you know certain products of ours, every um, Wednesday, Friday for other product lines of ours, uh, but you get multiple updates per week, so you can patch very aggressively if you choose to. Um, patching everything again, being able to patch the Windows platform and all the applications, including third parties, Mac, Linux, Unix, um, you name it. You need to be able to support all of them, and then patching everywhere, following that user, making sure that all the different experiences that you need to deliver to your users you can deliver the same level of security throughout each of those. And, you know, again, when we get into um, any good patch management process, you have to understand that there will be exceptions. Now, an exception doesn't stop there. One of the biggest things that, um, you know, we're continuing to push is when you get to an exception, that's not the end of your change control process. You also need to follow up that exception with additional mitigation steps. Um, so what, if you can't remediate, you need to mitigate. And it's all about control and containment at that point. Um, how can you reduce user privileges to make it so that if an exploit were, um, you know, executed on a system, that the attacker has less uh, ability to pivot? Um, that left-to-right movement um, is uh, east, the east-west uh, traffic, uh, once they get on that system, is critical to try to mitigate, and privilege management helps a lot there removing direct access to client purchase card um, data. Um, you know, again, around a privilege and identity perspective there. Virtualizing workloads. If I've got a critical app and that app has dependencies on legacy software that are, it's very vulnerable, maybe like an old Java 7 or Java, or Java 6 uh, runtime, how do I virtualize that application and give access to just the users that need it and secure that? Um, buffer it so that it, that environment doesn't have direct internet connectivity. Um, reducing exposure to neighboring systems, removing direct internet access, implementing application whitelisting, 
containerization in cases where removal of internet access, uh, internet access is not an option. Um, all these things are, they, they should be part of your patch management um, process. They should be there when an exception occurs. These are the things that I've done to mitigate that risk that I know I have to accept. And then finally, one of the most important parts of any security strategy is um, implementing a security control is great, but if I can't measure the success of that security control, how can I guarantee that it's been secured? Um, so uh, being able to get that insight, that matters. And being able to drive that insight to each of the different roles throughout my organization becomes critically important. So, uh, you know, for today, we wanted to give you kind of a general overview. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be getting back around to doing more product specific, um, you know, um, kind of demonstrations and things like that with Cortec. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do there is, again, we're going to do some follow on to explain the different routes, and then you can choose which routes might be ideal for you. So at this time, uh, Hannah, why don't we switch over to doing some Q&A, um, see if there's any questions from the group. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, all right. So if you guys have any questions, uh, go ahead and answer or ask them in the question box that you see. Um, it's about halfway through the, the dashboard there. Um, so first question we have, will the slides be available? Um, and yes, we can make those available to you, as well as the, um, the recording of the, the document of the presentation. Another question that came in is, uh, so um, support for um, Azure AWS environments, um, that's actually a, a very common question as well. Um, so one thing I could tell you is we, we have the ability to do a variety of things. Um, we have um, the, you know, I, I, I know of customers who are doing a variety of different approaches to this from running an instance of our products directly in an Azure or an AWS uh, environment and managing that environment solely from that uh, contained purview, um, or utilizing uh, what we call our cloud-enabled agent um, environment uh, features as well, where they can have a, a premise-based management interface that can manage the on-premise um, data center, but it can also manage agents that are uh, basically um, cloud-enabled so that they can get their marching orders directly from um, a cloud service that basically becomes the communication point or the proxy between them um, or being uh, you know, this, so there's a there's a variety of different options there but absolutely as we see the shift towards cloud it is a, a very um, you know common uh, uh, occurrence that we run into and we can absolutely help there too All right, are there any additional questions? I don't believe so. Okay. So do you guys have any uh, have any other questions, feel free to um, reach out to myself or Chris. Uh, we can provide our email addresses for you. Um, Chris, any last comments? Uh, no, it's a, it, uh, thank you for uh, inviting us on here today. It was great talking to everybody. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and look for a follow email shortly.